let me begin by saying that um, this is a new disease, a new virus, and we're only in the very first stages of discovering how it behaves, how it affects people, how many people it affects, um, how dangerous it is. And so uh, everything we say has to be regarded as preliminary and, and subject to change. But there are a few things that we do know about the disease uh, that I think are very important to bear in mind. <clears throat> the first is that it affects different people and different parts of the population in quite different ways. In about 80% of the population, uh, it's relatively mild, like having a normal flu. In about 20%, it's quite severe, like having a very severe flu that goes to the lungs. And in about 10% of people, it's sufficiently severe that it's life-threatening and requires treatment in an intensive care ward with, uh, a, with ventilators, which is a pipe that's inserted down the throat and in which oxygen is pumped into the lungs, even if you're not breathing. Um, this creates an extraordinary challenge for the healthcare system. And a lot of the worst effect of the pandemic may well come through effectively the collapse of our healthcare system. The, the death rate that we've had reported so far, which is about 2% to 5% in different countries, it assumes that the patients are receiving state-of-the-art healthcare and the very sick people are put into an, an intensive care ward and treated with a ventilator. But as the virus progresses, and I'll come in a moment to how it's likely to progress, the ability of the healthcare system to cope with the numbers who will be affected uh, will decline to the point where it crashes. To give you an example, in the state of Tasmania where I live, we have 530,000 people. The lowest estimate that the government is making of the proportion of the population who will contract the virus is 30%. That's 152,000 people, 53,000 people. Um, if 10% of those people, the affected people, require uh, a bed in an intensive care unit, that will be 15 to 16,000 people requiring a bed in an intensive care unit. In Tasmania, we have 30 ICU beds. Now, the 15,000 won't all be needed at the same time, but they will be needed within a few weeks of each other. And what you see is that the health system is not equipped to cope with a pandemic of this scale. What's happening in Italy and Spain, and I believe in Iran, is that the healthcare system is simply collapsing. It doesn't have anything like the capability to respond and treat uh, the population. The healthcare system in the province of Lombardy, which is in the north of Italy, is regarded as either the best or the third best in the world. So we're not talking about third world healthcare systems. We're talking about very, very high capability healthcare systems. And their estimate is they need 20 times more intensive care units than they currently have. Now, the, so the disease in some people is very dangerous and we're not yet clear what the characteristics of those people are. We do know that it affects the elderly in general worse. We know that it's more dangerous to people with underlying conditions of immune compromised, heart disease, diabetes, asthma, etc. anything to do with the lungs. But um, we're seeing alarming new evidence out of Europe that it's affecting young people 
much more than it was affecting young people in China. So we just don't know and we can't assume uh, that it only affects other people. It, it, it may well affect us, our family, even our children, much worse than we thought. Now, so that's one part of uh, what we have to bear in mind. The second part is that as a highly infectious virus, this disease is growing uh, exponentially. And many people have trouble thinking uh, about what exponential growth means. And there's a trap with exponential growth, which is you look at the situation today and you say, it's not too bad. How much worse could it get? Oh, well, it might get worse over time, but it's pretty good today. Now, I want to share with you an image that, uh, to make you think as we, as we speak. This is a lily pond. And lily ponds have, uh, you all have seen a pond with, with lily pads like this on it. Lily pads have the characteristic that they reproduce quite rapidly and they can grow exponentially. And we often use this in statistics to help people grasp the concept of exponential growth. If it takes 30 days for a lily pond to be 100% covered with lily pads, think about what proportion of the lily, how long does it take for the pond to be half covered with pads? The answer is 29 days. One more day and you've gone from half the pond to the full pond being covered. If you uh, go to back a few days, so if we're, the pond is fully covered with pads on day 30, half covered on day 29, on day 20, only 0.01% of the pond is covered with lily pads. One thousandth of the pond has a lily pad on it. So if you look out at your pond, out your window, you see the lily pads, there's a handful of lily pads, what's to worry about? But the problem is they're doubling every day. If one lily pad makes one more lily pad every day, then it doubles every day. So on day 20, only 0.01% is covered. By day 24, only 1.5% is covered. Day 26, 6.25% is covered. Day 28, only a quarter is covered. Two days later, 100% of the pond is covered. So it's very important for us not to think what does the situation look like today, but to think what will it look like in a week, two weeks, a month's time. And anything that is growing exponentially has the capacity to overwhelm our systems and, in a sense, overwhelm our mind uh, that the pace of growth can be so quick. And this is what explains the explosion of cases that we observe in apparently a couple of days in countries like Italy, Spain, France, Iran, and, and of course, beginning with China. The conclusion of all this is that it's much better to not get this disease than to get it. Uh, at the present time, we don't have a vaccine. I'm 100% certain we will develop a vaccine. Um, we don't have any approved drugs. Um, I think we will get drugs that are able to retard it. There's evidence that we already know of some, but none of them are approved, none of them are tested. A vaccine will be developed and the crisis will come to an end because of that. We will be able to protect our population, but vaccines take time. And because vaccines are given to otherwise healthy people, you have to make sure that there's a very, very low proportion of um, side effects, which means a lot of testing. In the 1970s, there's a famous 
instance of a flu, the swine flu, for which a vaccine was rapidly developed and introduced and people were vaccinated. The problem was that the vaccine itself killed more people than the swine flu. Um, and obviously we have to guard against that happening again. I believe we're already quite advanced in developing the, in characterizing the antibodies and developing a vaccine, but the testing will take time. And then the production of the vaccine will take time. The way we produce vaccines today is by incubating antibody an analogs in eggs. And this is obviously quite a manual process to develop six billion doses enough to vaccinate the world will take a long time. The earliest time we expect to see a vaccine available is about November. So the task before us as family members, as, as employees, as leaders um, in our community, the task is to protect ourselves in the meantime. Uh, the best way to protect yourself is to not contact people who are infected. Uh, when we talk about social distancing, this is the age old technique of dealing with highly infectious diseases. Uh, it's very important to recognize that there are multiple <clears throat> vectors, pathways to be infected. With a normal flu, uh, the, the virus is carried in water droplets that come from sneezing and coughing and so on. And it's carried in surfaces that are touched by infected people. The coronavirus, the present coronavirus, uh, also appears to have other vectors that are very important. One of them is that it's carried in water vapor, which is different from water droplets because water droplets are a liquid, but water vapor is a gas. And that means it can circulate in the air, uh, potentially over quite a few meters distance. So it's important if we're protecting ourselves from contracting the virus with contact with other people, that we have physical distance separating us because of the water vapor issue. The virus also appears to be transmissible through uh, feces. Um, obviously then means staying away from feces of other people, which most of us try to do anyway. Um, and it also appears to be transmissible through animals. So family pets can carry the virus and then pass it on to human beings. The, the upshot of all this, and, and on surfaces, the disease appears to last um, from varying from a few hours on things like cloth to up to 48 hours on surfaces like steel. So it's very important to do two things to protect ourselves. One is to maintain distance from anybody that we don't know is safe. The other is to sanitize ourselves and surfaces. A further problem with this particular virus is that it is contagious days before, up to two weeks before, but certainly about five days before in most cases, it's, it's symptomatic. So you could meet somebody who's perfectly healthy, as it, it appears, or you yourself can appear perfectly healthy, but be tra transmitting the virus to others before it becomes symptomatic. So we can't use some of the techniques that we do have used in the past to manage flu epidemics, such as measuring the temperature and isolating people who are apparently sick. Of course, we should do that, <clears throat> but that doesn't guarantee that people aren't transmitting the disease. So the two keys to protecting ourselves are maintain social distance, which means keeping away from other people, keeping distance, don't going to places where there are a lot of other people uh, and, and keeping that distance. The second is sanitizing, using hand sanitizer and, 
and wiping surfaces with sanitizing agents. Alcohol, uh, the alcohol sanitizers, alcohol at a concentration between 70% and 90% is a very effective sterilizing agent against the virus. So alcohol wipes, um, sanitizing wipes, sanitizing gels uh, are very effective. So if you must go out, um, it's important to be aware of when you've touched a surface or an object or a person that you don't know is safe and assume everything is, is a possibility in the middle of an epidemic. Be aware of when you've done that and sanitise yourself and sanitise that surface. This requires a degree of change of personal habits and personal thinking that not many of us are, are accustomed to. Um, I was recently in France and for hundreds of years, French people have greeted each other by kissing on the cheek. Uh, and <clears throat> today, uh, that's gone. People don't kiss on the cheek. They nod to each other. They greet each other without physical contact. You see this everywhere you go in France now. We, we in Australia tend to want to be laid back and, um, and, and generous in our physical contact. We have to learn to change that at least while this epidemic is going on. So um, I might leave it there and go to questions, but just to recap, uh, this is a very infectious disease. It's growing exponentially. It's dangerous in uh, a certain percentage of the population, very dangerous. The healthcare system is very likely to be overwhelmed by it, and therefore we can't rely upon receiving state-of-the-art uh, treatment. We need to therefore protect ourselves, and the two keys to that are a high degree of discipline around social distance and a high degree of discipline around sanitizing surfaces and our bodies. Um, I'll leave it there and go to questions and at this point. Rob, did you want to make any more comments before we move to questions? Um, the a lot of questions around can you catch it again and what's the proof around that? Um, and, you know, are, is Australia doing the right thing? So uh, it does appear that you can catch it again. Um, again, we don't know enough about how the biology of this virus is working. Uh, we certainly have had reported instances of people who've had the virus, recovered, been cleared, and then contracted it for a second or third time. What this is suggesting is that, at least in some people, the immunity that develops dissipates after a period of time of weeks. Whether this is true for the population as a whole, we don't know. The normal pattern is you, you contract a virus, your uh, immune system mobilizes an antibody that is effective in, in identifying and eliminating that virus, and that stays in your system so that you're permanently um, immunized against the virus. There, we certainly have seen cases where that isn't happening with this disease, which again makes it more concerning. Is Australia doing the right things? Uh, in my opinion, the approach in Australia has been to emphasize not panicking, carrying on as normal as much as possible, waiting till we have to take measures and then regrettably panicking into taking the measures after effectively they're too late. A lot of the measures that government can enforce are to uh, prevent people from mixing together, socialising and passing on the virus. I saw this morning uh, from the United States images of people, of college kids, um, university students at spring break in Florida, and there's Rooms packed full of people drinking and dancing, 
with no concern at all. So um, what government can do is prevent people from passing it on. The problem is if you wait until it's obvious that you need to do it, bearing in mind the exponential growth, it will be too late. Bearing in mind exponential growth and that the disease is infectious before it's symptomatic. If you wait till day 28, when 25% of the population is infected, it's too late because that 25% will have already passed on the virus to other people and the cat's out of the bag. So I'm critical of the Australian government emphasising not panicking and carrying on. I, I would rather see more extreme measures taken too soon and then find that they weren't needed then find that they were needed and our healthcare system has collapsed. I think the conclusion of that is it falls to us as individuals, as families, and as a company to protect ourselves and not rely upon government alone. Uh, Robert, do you have any other questions? Jonathan. Yeah. Yeah, just, just around, a lot of people are thinking, should I send my kids to school? Should I take them out? These are all personal things. What's your personal view? Um, and I suppose with regards to workplaces and, you know, should you really be enforcing people working from home? And I'm probably thinking a little bit more outside of Boundary Bend because obviously we've got our own policies of enforcing these things. But um, some people on this call, you know, have kids at other schools, aren't employees of Boundary Bend and would be most interested in your view. Yes, at Boundary Bend, we've gone as far as we can and pushing hard to find ways to keep people separate and continue working. Um, on the school question, I personally would take my kids out of school. Um, my daughter is in college in the United States and she's, uh, she's now home with me because I think it's safer to be here and I don't want her to contract the virus. Uh, I feel for teachers who feel exposed to the virus at school. Um, and I, the concern, uh, one concern has been that if you take the children out of school, they're likely to go and visit grandparents, etc. cetera. Um, I think that's a fairly uh, inadequate argument for keeping the schools open. How do we justify saying that all gatherings over 100 should be prevented and yet the schools are open in which you've got hundreds of kids socialising with each other and playing in playgrounds and so forth. Uh, personally, I think we should close the schools and I think if it's at all possible for you as individuals to bring your kids home, I would do that. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, Sarah, maybe just go to the questions and anyone who's got questions can type them into that Q&A and Jonathan's happy to stay here for a couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah, there's lots. There's lots of questions, so I'll just try and get through them methodically. So, what's the problem with vulnerable communities that don't have the space of the space for three for the metre distance or one and a half metre distance that's been in, uh, implemented? You say, what's the problem with that? Yeah. Yep. Well, they're going to be more vulnerable. Yeah. That's what I thought. And if a, if a product describes itself as antibacterial disinfectant, is that effective against the virus? Not necessarily. A bacteria and a virus are different, different organisms. Uh, however, most of the antibacterial products are alcohol-based. What, what you need to look for is a minimum of 60%, but more ideally 70 to 90% of alcohol content in the sanitising product. Great, thank you. We've got a question about the session being recorded. It is being recorded and will be given to people who require it um, as well. Um, Jonathan, can you please comment on the information that it can be passed on by pets? Because apparently there's some conflicting information from the WHO on that. Again, we don't have a, a conclusive evidence on this, but there have been instances of pets contracting the virus, even of dying of the virus, and of infecting family members. Um, these are reports. We don't know how it happens and, and how widely it happens, but um, I would be careful with pets too. Okay. 
And what's your thoughts on wearing face masks, even to the extent of wearing them in the workplace? Face masks are effective in two uh, dimensions. One is in inhibiting the movement of water droplets, which is a main, uh, one of the primary vectors for transmission. So they're helpful in preventing, if you have the virus, in preventing uh, or inhibiting infection of others. They also are valuable in helping you to be more aware of your face and not touching your face, but particularly your eyes. Uh, if you do it as a little exercise, just say to yourself, I'm not going to touch my face. And what you'll find is that within a matter of seconds or minutes, your face starts to itch like hell. And you, you have this overwhelming desire to scratch and touch your face. We touch our faces all the time during the day. It's very easy for people to say, stop touching your face. It's much more difficult to do it. This virus can be passed on and frequently is through the eyes. So wearing a face mask is a good way of reminding yourself to not touch your face. But very few face masks are capable of uh, straining out a virus sized object. Viruses are very, very small. So most face masks, unless they're specifically designed for it, will not filter out a virus in the air. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, apologies if these are a bit mished, mashed, but they're coming in thick and fast. So um, why don't they already isolate everyone over 70 in Australia if they're most at risk? Why does government do a lot of things? If I, if I was over 70, and regrettably I'm closer to that than I used to be, uh, I would be isolating myself. Um, and I'd be telling my friends to isolate myself. A lot of the aged care homes have moved to isolation, preventing family members visiting unless the person is, is particularly sick. Um, a lot of seniors are realising that they're at risk and, and taking steps. Um, but I think government's being too slow in, in helping this part of the population to isolate itself. Yeah, I think you've pretty much answered this question already in that one too, because on the same token was why are they permitting seniors to stand together at supermarkets in mornings to allow them access? I think it's probably wrapped up in what you've just shared, yeah. unless you've got anything else to add. No, I, I no. think it's a good question and I'm not responsible for what government does. <laughs> Um, from what you've seen to date, how long do you think until the global consumption resumes back to previous levels? I'm assuming that means around food and uh, I'm assuming. Oh, that's a very difficult question. Um, I think the world will end up being safe from this virus and return to normal when we have a vaccine and we have therapies, uh, people will calm down and However, I, th I think that this is an experience we're going through globally that will change the way people think. It's quite remarkable to realise that in Australia, for example, and in any country I know of, there's been no planning for this sort of an event. You would imagine that any health minister or, or head of the health system would be able to reach on the shelf and have bring out the folder that has the plan for dealing with a pandemic of this type. We've, we've known for years that it's coming, that it's possible. But in fact, there aren't such plans. Um, the other, so I think there'll be a lot more emphasis on protecting and planning for the future and planning for the possibility of sudden demands on the healthcare system that are much greater than a normal average day. Uh, the other long-term impact I think will be people realising that it's very uh, vulnerable, it makes us very vulnerable to be dependent on very long, geographically long distance supply chains and very narrow supply chains. For example, we're discovering that about 90% of the drugs we take in Australia, medicines, contain, are either manufactured in China or contain an active ingredient made only in China. And to save money and be cost effective, we've ended up with a, quite a number of these drugs that have only one source, and that source is in China. 
And not surprisingly, what the Chinese government has done is say any of these drugs that may be effective with coronavirus, we're banning the export. And any country's government would do the same thing. They're not going to say, well, we privilege foreign citizens over our own people. But having no alternative sources means that we're in the event of a disruption to the system, we're very vulnerable. And we're finding out that that's true of all sorts of products. Automobile manufacturing plants around the world are closing because one component is only sourced from China and it's not being produced. And therefore the whole factory closes and tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people are losing their jobs because their whole system was dependent on a long complex supply chain. I think there'll be a move back towards decoupling and more local production, um, export of goods rather than a mere component in a supply chain. So the long-term effects will be a rethinking of how our social system and our even our economic systems work. Uh, but anybody who's thinking, well, this will blow over in a couple of weeks and we'll bounce back, I, I don't think that's likely. Okay. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, do you think it'll get to the point where no workers will turn up for work due to risk? And alternatively, do you think it will be feasible for people to continue to work if they abide by social distancing recommendations and cleanliness? I think it will be feasible and uh, there'll be activities that are essential. Um, I, I would rather put the question the other way around. Let's look for things that can be done at home and do that rather than just say, let's ban all, all activities. Um, we can make our workplaces safe. Uh, and obviously Boundary Bend, I think has been right in the forefront of doing that. We just have to find more and more ways of doing things like we're doing here, of meeting over the web and so forth. Thank you. Um... If you were advising policymakers on stimulus packages, what would your advice be? I think the stimulus packages that we've had in the past, which revolve around reducing interest rates and small uh, cash grants to a large number of people, are unlikely to work. Uh, when where interest rates are already close to zero, reducing them another half a point closer to zero is going to have very minimal effect. I think government has to move away from thinking about stimulus packages. And because if whole industry sectors are shutting down, it's a stimulus package is irrelevant. If I've got a few hundred bucks in my pocket and the whole tourist industry is closed and I work in the tourist industry, not going to have any real effect at all. I think governments are going to have to take responsibility for whole chunks of the economy that they haven't in, in the past. The first priority, of course, is protecting banks. If banks fold up, then the, the whole economic system collapses. Um, it's very likely that governments are going to have to guarantee debts in order to keep the banks afloat. Uh, in other developed countries overseas, we've seen quite remarkable measures being announced. In Denmark, the government has announced that the, it will assume responsibility for the salary of any employee who would otherwise have lost their job during, due to the coronavirus pandemic. So hundreds of thousands or millions of people will be moved onto the government payroll in order to keep the economic system going through this period where it's being disrupted. In France, the president has just announced that no business will be allowed to fold up as a result of coronavirus. Government will guarantee its future. This is very different from stimulus package type thinking. And it's very unfamiliar type of policy for us in Australia. Thanks, Jonathan. Just to set the scene for you there's over 25 questions still to come so maybe okay. grab some coffee if you need it <laughs> um I've, next one i've noticed a trend that many people in the bush are just dismissing this as an urban problem or urban panic 
does the more isolated nature of the bush mean that it's less likely to be as big a problem as in rural and regional and remote areas? And are there particular things people in the bush should be doing? I like this question. I, I live in the bush and I live in a rural area. My, my neighbours are farmers. I see this phenomenon of people saying, we don't have to worry about it, it's an urban problem. The way I would put it is, we have the opportunity to isolate ourselves more easily. If you live in a giant apartment block, it's very difficult to isolate yourself. Uh, many of us have small scale food production, a vegetable garden, chooks, etc. So we have the ability to decouple ourselves from the system to a greater degree, but it certainly isn't the case that we're going to be exempt from the problems. Um, the other thing you see in rural communities is people uh, working together. I've had the very moving experience of being um, here at home, isolated, having just returned from France. And I've had probably six different neighbours call me and saying, can I drop things off for you? And, or I've just gone to the door and there's a big package of frozen meat from a neighbour saying, I thought this might be helpful. So people who live in rural areas tend to be used to this. I'm not saying it doesn't happen in the city, um, but we should see it as an opportunity but certainly not as a free pass that won't affect us, it will. Okay, thank you. Um, next one's around uh, environment. So is pollution a causal factor um, to how impactful the virus can be? Um, I read that Milan has high pollution, so alluding to the Italy issue. It's a good question. We don't know the answer to this. Um, anything that weakens the lungs, uh, in a disease that can go to the lungs and that being a major cause of, of uh, morbidity clearly might have an effect. But again, we're only a few weeks into understanding this virus and we really don't know. Thank you. You might not be able to answer this one. I think you've kind of alluded to it, but how have other countries in lockdown continued to keep food supply lines open and how? Most of them are locking down individuals and families, but keeping supply chains open. And I think that's what we're likely to do in Australia. Yeah. Um, and it's important for us at Boundary Bend, we are an essential part of the food supply system. And we need to think about that. It's a social responsibility to make sure people have high quality food available during this period. Thanks, Jonathan. <clears throat> Um, any thoughts around outside workers or farming staff? I guess their risk. Um, it's a similar issue, isn't it? That we need to help them understand what's happening uh, and try to ensure that they abide by the same sort of social distancing as we do. It's a, more of a challenge because they're um, less part of our system less exposed to the information and etc. We, we need to take special responsibility for thinking about how to educate and train them and bring them into the procedures that we have. Uh, thank you. Can you expand on your comment regarding kids contracting the virus? Is this something coming out of Europe? We've always known that kids will contract the virus probably as easily as any other part of the population but the evidence has been that it manifests much more um, weakly, um, much less severe in children and, and young people than in old people. That old people are, are more um, affected by it. But this appears to be different in Europe. The pattern appears to be different in Europe than in China. We don't know why, but we do know one thing about the way the virus uh, attacks the body, it binds to what's called the ACE2 receptor. And the ACE2 receptor is five times overexpressed in people of East Asian origin than in uh, Caucasians. So that might be a, a, a genetic difference in the way the virus expresses. Uh, and that may be causing some of the difference we're seeing in Europe. But in Europe, we are seeing quite alarming stories of a higher proportion of young people, um, by that I mean children up to about 40, being affected by the disease. And some of them are having very serious effects of lung damage. 
So we certainly mustn't take the view that children are exempt from either cap catching it or um, being affected by it. Uh, next one, um, should we all be extra vigilant with flu shots this season, including young people? I, I think we should. Uh, there's no reason at all if you have the coronavirus why you can't have another flu virus as well. And having two different pathogens active in your system simultaneously would more than double your risk of having it progress to something that's quite serious. So certainly we should all be getting our flu shots this year as well, even if it doesn't include protection against the coronavirus. Okay, um, if the virus is carried for up to two weeks prior to symptoms <coughs> being shown, and considering the exponential growth, then the number of confirmed cases is a minor portion of the actual cases. I think that's correct. Um, there's probably far more people infected than we know about because they haven't yet become symptomatic. The other thing, of course, is that in most countries, it's quite difficult to get tested. And they won't test you unless your case is quite serious. So there's probably a lot more people carrying the virus, um, either because they're not symptomatic at all or because the symptoms are minor, uh, because they won't test them. Any of you have had the experience of calling the testing uh, centres you have to go through quite a complex process to even get permission to get tested. So the numbers we're seeing of, of infected cases are not accurate. There's no uh, question they're, um, they're not accurate because we're not testing enough people to know. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, next one is, are vinegar-based sanitizers effective against the virus? Um, vinegar probably helps, but it won't have enough alcohol to be reliable and effective. Okay. Um, and would you... Well, it won't have enough acid to be effective. It'll probably help, but I wouldn't rely upon it. Thank you. Um, would you self-isolate until a vaccine's released, especially if you had a child with asthma? Uh, it's a very personal question. My my daughter actually does have asthma and I'm really uh, concerned that she doesn't contract the disease. Um, we're, we're isolated and we're going to be very, very careful. She, uh, she's sort of badgering me to go out and do things, go shopping, socialise, and I'm carefully <laughs> explaining to her that it's really important she doesn't catch the disease. Um, we have to be practical and feasible. But the most important thing is to change these daily habits of, of contact with other people, interaction, surfaces, etc. cetera. Uh, okay, um, this is quite a long one. Do you think that non-vulnerable people, such as the young, should be tested if they have symptoms? Or should these tests, which are limited in supply, be saved for those who are vulnerable, like the elderly? And second part of the question, what is the benefit in getting tested if there is no vaccine or treatment? So I think the main benefit is that people will be aware that they can pass it on and not kid themselves that it's just a cold or a flu or whatever. Um, but it's a good question because yes, we don't have enough tests, we don't have enough capacity, we didn't prepare for this. Uh, so there's no question testing is being rationed. And if you call up and say, I'd like to get tested, they'll just say no. Uh, if you say, I've got these symptoms, they'll say, well, have you been in China? Have you been in Italy? Uh, you've got to prove that you're eligible for a test. But the benefit is that um, you will know that you're, you're a problem and hopefully change your behaviour and not pass it on to people. Okay, there's a few questions on that one. So I'm just gonna, not gonna re-ask that. 
One question I'll just go to now because we just spoke about the vinegar. Somebody is asking, what's the best alcohol to use? Is it isopropyl alcohol or metho or what's your thoughts there? Any of the alcohols, pure alcohol, even ethanol is fine. Yeah. Okay, um, next one. Uh, how long before you think overseas travel will be safe again? I think it'll rapidly get to the point where um, being in Australia is no safer than being overseas. Um, I don't actually believe that being on an aircraft is a particularly dangerous activity. Um, most modern aircraft have very effective filtration, air filtration systems, and they do uh, filter out virus level particles. So um, it's not overseas travel per se that's dangerous. Um, however, country after country is shutting their borders, so we're not going to be traveling for a while. And once <coughs> things are closed off, um, it's going to be a while before they're reopened. And it will vary by country, from country to country. So we've had things like <coughs> Indonesia, um, until very recently reported no cases. And I happen to um, be involved in a business with Indonesia. I simply don't believe that, I haven't believed that Indonesia's got no cases. They've now announced they do, but they've got no testing capacity, so we just don't know. So uh, I wouldn't be traveling to Indonesia in a hurry, for example. Um, another one about the, the virus life. Um, I heard the virus can live on cardboard for up to seven days. In your opinion, how accurate do you believe this is to be true? Seven days sounds extreme for um, the virus on, a, on cardboard, um, but we do know this is a, a virus that lives longer than most outside of a, a, of a human host. Okay. This is a very long question, so I'm going to paraphrase it. Um, we'll, we seem to be presented with two unsustainable options. Overwhelm the health system through quick, a quick spread or bunker down and stay home. The latter option seems just as unsustainable as the former. People will lose their jobs and not have money to spend. Businesses will close and not be able to reopen. I find it very hard to foresee a situation where humans cease to socialise. However, that seems to be the message in today's webinar. So here's the question. So what is the... So go, do you want to talk on that first? No, 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 no. Yeah. So um, what is the social structure you see emerging from this situation? Are people going to become quite isolated and self-sufficient, avoiding communal spaces such as cafes? Um, the purpose of the isolation is to reduce the speed of the transmission so that the wave of cases uh, is reduced. We might end up with roughly the same number of people ending up being infected, but spreading that over a long period of time so the health care system has a better chance of, of coping. Uh, we're talking about things we can do in the period before a vaccine is developed and flattening out that curve so that the healthcare system has a better chance of being able to respond is what, what we're talking about doing. However, I do think that the experience of going through this, this event will change people's attitude. I, I think once we know we've been vaccinated and there isn't a live virus, circulating again in the community that we're vulnerable to. Obviously, people will socialise and um, the world will resume as, as no normal, but it may be a, a bit of a new normal in, in people's attitudes. Thank you. Um, that's for about 10 more, Jonathan. Um, okay, keep going. What language can we use to manage or control the potential or likelihood of stigma directed towards people who contract the virus? Well, I, I, it's very clear that the virus is affecting all types of people. 
Um, not all, in fact, most don't become particularly sick. Um, it's certainly no one's fault that they contract it. Uh, it's very easy to contract it, so there's no way we can blame people. Um, it, it's just, it's bad luck. And so um, we, we need to treat people who are infected um, just as people who've, who've had the bad luck to be infected. I, I don't know what more I can say about that. Thanks. Um, also, would you be able to um, share that exact example about the fuel pump and, and the, the, the amount of people using the, the fuel pump at the petrol station that you did on Tuesday? Rob's just asked if you can share that story. Oh, it was just an example of how, how we need to change the way we think. Uh, we go to the petrol station to refill the car, you grab hold of the handle of the nozzle, open up your car, pump the fuel in. Um, hundreds of people have touched that handle. And if any of them have the virus, well, you've got it on your hands. Then as you walk in to pay, you touch your face, touch your eyes, you take out your credit card, you take out your phone, the virus is then on the credit card and the phone, and, and you haven't even thought about it. Why would we, in the past, we've never had to think about such things. It's a case of thinking through all the points of contact with the other people who are the bearers of the virus. Thank you. Okay, can the six month world lockdown end up being worse than the disease in terms of job losses, drops of living standards, et cetera? Yes. <laughs> that was a quick answer. <laughs> well, um, I think the, co the economic consequences uh, have the potential to be very grave. Um, the entire sectors of the economy are being eliminated and um, the rate of job loss could be quite extraordinary. I don't believe there's any that we need to have that happen. Um, governments can assume a lot more responsibility than they have um, because we know it's a short-term thing. If we know it's a short-term thing, it's a case of bridging these, these uh, impacts of the disease. But certainly the economic effect can be at least as severe as the disease itself, although death is pretty severe. It may only be a small proportion of the population, but you can understand people uh, taking pretty extreme measures when they're at risk of dying. Yeah, yeah. Another one. Um, do you think there will be any changes from the Chinese to tighten up their hygiene practices or food regulations post coronavirus? Oh, undoubtedly, undoubtedly. Um, no, People have been traveling in China and talking about what you see in wet markets and so on. Um, there was a story of a guy who worked at the uh, Biological Research Institute in Wuhan, who uh, was responsible for cremating the animals that they'd been uh, undertaking medical research with. And they died, the animals died, and his job was to cremate them. But instead of cremating them, he was taking them down to the local wet market and selling them because people like exotic animals to eat. So he was taking down dead monkeys and selling them in the local market. Um, we, obviously, we've got to stop stuff like that happening. And they did stop him, of course. Thank you. Um, so I heard a rumour that, that guy's been executed. Oh. Um, another question, what is the severity of coronavirus in babies, in particular babies under six months of age? In most cases, uh, if the baby contracts it, it'll be, it'll be very li little symptoms. But again, it's, we're only a few weeks into it, there'll be exceptions. <clears throat> but our evidence is babies are not an especially vulnerable part of the population, vulnerable in terms of the manifestation of the disease. Yeah, this is one, this is, sorry, this is one I'm interested in too. So um, a question around the well, plaquenil. The other not interesting. <laughs> no, this is my 
You want you'll know why when I ask it. Okay. <laughs> um, a question about Plaquenil or hydroxychloroquine. So given the drug is used for the treatment of various things and there's some um, media going on around how it might help reduce um, you know, your uh, likelihood of catching the condition, while we wait for the clinical trials, is this a drug that um, people should be considering or is what are your thoughts on the, on this? Uh, the evidence is that hydroxychloroquine or chlor any, any of the forms of chloroquine um, they don't stop you catching the disease, but they appear. There is evidence that it inhibits the progress of the disease from just a flu to uh, lung lung disease, lung failure, and organ failure. Um, it does that by by impeding the development of what's called the cytokine storm in the body that comes with the viral infection. So. Uh, we haven't tested it, it's not approved for this purpose, but there is evidence that in, in vitro, that is in test tubes, that it's capable of killing the virus and of inhibiting its development. Um, chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine, but any form of chloroquine is almost unused nowadays because it's a prophylactic against malaria and most of the malaria around the world is now resistant to chloroquine. So there's not, there are not many other uh, approved uses of chloroquine, and there's not much of it around. Thank you. Um, but it's easy to make, apparently. As a pharmaceutical, it's easy to make. Um, when you're cleaning surfaces with 70% alcohol, what is the proper pr procedure? So um, this person's read that um, you use one for wiping and one for spraying and that you have to let the alcohol remain wet for at least 30 seconds on the surface for effectiveness. But yeah, just just yeah. wipe the surface down with the alcohol and let the alcohol evaporate off and that should be effective. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, this person is saying that gone into self-isolation because there's a family member with um, respiratory issues. Um, can you elaborate? Well, I think you might have already done this, but if, if you've got anything to add on your opinion on COVID-19 in relation to, to children who suffer from respiratory conditions, you might have already covered this. I think it's best, obviously, and it's a, it's a trite thing to say, it's best if they don't contract the virus. I would. Um, and I am self-isolating with a daughter who has asthma. Um, however, if young children with these um, conditions contract the virus, they're probably going to be all right. But it's best not to find out the hard way. Yeah. Two more. Um, trying to flatten the curve makes perfect sense to try and manage it. But how do you do it without completely destroying the economy? So I think you've kind of covered this, but is there anything else you'd like to add to that one, Jonathan? I, I think we flattening the curve means a relatively short-term uh, decoupling of, pe of people in the economic system. And there's no reason why we have to let these things just run. Uh, but it requires a revolution in government thinking to say, well, we're going to guarantee jobs. Government can do that, can just print money if it needs to. Uh, if that was a permanent policy, I'd be totally against it. But in order to bridge this period, guaranteeing banks, guaranteeing companies, making sure things don't fail, guaranteeing airlines. Um, airlines are shutting down completely. Well, if they just lay off everyone and those people are all out of work, of course, the economic consequence is catastrophic. But if we know that's a short term, uh, issue, government can step in. Yeah, uh, there's, there's more that have come through. So um, this one's interesting. Is, are you briefing government? Somebody wants to know. No, I'm not. I'm briefing you guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, does the virus remain in the community forever or will it eventually fizzle out? And so will it sort of become like the annual flu vaccine shot? 
I think it will. I think it'll be around um, more or less permanently, but we'll be able to be vaccinated against it and our immune system will be able to resist it. Um, and what is the latest on the virus, is the infectiousness of the virus once it's left the host? Uh, once it's left the host? Mm. Um, again, we don't know, but it seems that everyone infected with the disease infects about two and a half other people, but that's an average. Some people if they're in a crowded disco, are going to infect a lot more people. Mm. And if it's if it's me at home here on my own, sitting in my library, I'm not going to infect anyone, except maybe my wife. Yeah. <laughs> um, she's avoiding me too. Okay. Uh, last one for now, so please send any more through. Um, can you please draw on historical parallels to the likely scope of the global economic downturn just to help us gauge its impact? It's very difficult to do that because previous pandemics took place in a, in a different world economically. The world today is way more integrated um, and, and globally connected than it ever has been in the past. So if we go back to, for example, the 1918 pandemic that killed 50 million people, um, we're talking about a world without air travel, with large parts of the world having essentially little or no economic interaction with the rest of the world. But today, there's no part of the globe that's uh, isolated from air travel and connection and products moving around and components in complex product systems, etc. So we're, we're in blue sky. We don't know the effect of this, um, uh, how this will affect the economy going forward. And um, do you, you might have mentioned um, people more at risk, but what's your thoughts on pregnant women and if they should take any additional precautions? Um, I haven't seen any evidence that pregnant women are more vulnerable or more likely to be affected or that their child is likely to be more affected. But again, if you're pregnant, you don't want to have this disease or any flu, really. And uh, what do you think about what the AFL are doing? Um, certainly, we can't have crowds uh, at the AFL, and obviously they've stopped that. Um, as a mad dog... Richmond supporter. I'm glad to see, I'm going to be glad to watch my team tonight. Um, I actually think it's just a matter of time but before a player is diagnosed and they shut it down. All right, uh, last one. Do you think Maguire infrastructure is a good stock to buy now? <laughs> I don't know Maguire infrastructure, but Oh, I assume this is Macquarie infrastructure. Yeah, that's what the, I assume, but that's what the question says, yeah. I think I might take on hold uh, questions about stock recommendations for the moment. Yeah. <laughs> now, look, I hope I addressed everyone's questions because they were coming through via text, email, chat, and the Q&A panel box. So I tried my best to coordinate them. Um, so if there's any other questions, please pass them through. And if I accidentally missed your question, please just send us an email and we'll address it with you and let you know the Sorry. answer. So, Sarah. Uh, yep. Um, I just wanted to thank Jonathan. And I think the question around should we just, you know, get on with it, let it run riot, you know, the economic loss, you know, both ways, you bug it both ways to a certain extent, but I really think if you think about it, the economic loss is already here with so many airlines shutting and things that have already happened. So we are where we are, and delaying it to me seems like such a terrific idea because there's more 
and more known about the disease every day and there's more and more scientists working on it everywhere to look for potentially cures for the symptoms or to stop it getting to your chest and also a vaccine and that can only be good for you know the death rate or the long-term implication of the virus on some people um so you know it's certainly today wasn't about us having all the answers. Jonathan's the director of Boundary Bend. We're very lucky to have him. He's a great source of knowledge on so many things. And it's really just, you know, one man's view, if I can say that. So I really think that we're not here trying to lecture everyone on what Australia should do or anyone else. We're just saying, well, this is what we think. And if this can help any individual person make a decision around what they and their family are going to do with regards to children and workplace and all these things, Hopefully, you're slightly better equipped to make up your own mind. The, the only thing that Jonathan said that I sort of, I agree that it's no one's fault if they get it, but I actually think that cowboy attitudes and um, disrespect for the, the virus itself and the implication it can have on the vulnerable um, and behaviours of some people, you know, should or can be heavily criticised because that's the worst thing that can happen is a she'll be right, mate, and you're weak and whatever, and not realising you might be giving it to someone who, who, you know, who is in that ten percent or five percent or whatever who's immune compromised. So, um, again, just a few thoughts. There's no easy answers, and hopefully you, you know, hopefully you just got something out of the day, or it gives you and your family something to think about and talk about on what what you're going to do and what you think's best. So. Let's hope the government act responsibly. I'm with Jonathan that even nine months out of all of our lives in a lot of isolation with not much socialising or anything is a very, very small price to pay um, in a whole lifetime when we know there'll be a cure. We've just got to get to that point to keep our loved ones who are more susceptible safe. Um, and hopefully next week they'll come out and say that the virus has mutated and it's nowhere near as aggressive as it used to be or whatever. Um, or that you can take this medicine, whether it's hydroxychloroquine or a HIV antiviral or something, to, if you do get it, stop it going to your chest. So all of those things are possible. So it's, it's, it could, it could um, be resolved a lot quicker. But if you catch it in the meantime, you don't give yourself that chance. So that's me. Do you want to say anything else, Jonathan or Sarah? Was there any other questions last minute that have come in? No, there's no more questions. Thanks. Thank you all. Yeah, sincere thanks, Jonathan, and, and stay well. And looks like you still have a few books to read. <laughs> <laughs> well, we going down the bookshop later today. <laughs> well, that's a bit risky. Stock See up. ya. See thanks. you. Talk soon. Thank you.